when they have time for the rules of conduct. You are not just going to receive. So you prepare yourself. Because when you meet, each has a song, a hymn, a revelation, and a word. So you go with something. That's why a whole chairman, an apostle will be preaching. And an old lady will raise a song. And the apostle will stop and join the old lady. Go to other churches where that you see these things happen. When the papa is speaking, the papa is speaking. It is a brand. So the person seated there is attentive. That's why Mama Eunice Addison was able to get a lot, a lot of songs. Our fathers will be ministering and the woman will sit somewhere there and raise a song. It has dropped. The word misses on her heart and then the piano on her heart produces some songs. It is a brand. Alexander Nanayao Kumilabi. Keep clapping. Accra, keep clapping. Tamale, keep clapping. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We give the glory to Jesus. And turn. Thank you very much. You will come again. Now, before I continue, I want to just state that I'm also very Mama. I started from Kufura Secretary, uh, Kufura Sectech. So, Mary Mama, if you are in the house, I'm also an old boy from Mary Mama before we went to Madadia. So, Kufura Sector guys in the house, uh, so no preset guys. We are all together. Thank you very much for that. This evening, I'm humbled to be part of this program. And I first of all want to bring you greetings from the headquarters of the Church of Pentecost. The management and staff up there who are supporting us to run the administration of the church. I also want to extend uh, the greetings from the chairman and the executive council members who are really supporting me want to show my appreciation to them for agreeing and accepting that I become one of the main speakers for this special conference. To the youth director and his team, I'm very grateful to you. And then my senior brother, Esu Asante Minya, and the patron, we say thank you very much. My colleague apostles, area heads, and their wives in the house, and ministers are very grateful to you for. I think most of you may be here because maybe JS was coming and it's humbling that you are here to give me that support. I also want to thank, thank my host, our host, Apostle Yawaji Kwate, who has been a friend uh, since somewhere 82, 83, before the end of the Alliance, and for organizing uh, you to be here with me. See that um, Majuju Kakra. Majuju, uh, when I was picked from the airport, we were going to inspect the I'm still sharing because this is an impact makers conference. So we want to make impact. Where we, we decided to come and go and inspect the ongoing project. And then inadvertently the, the driver made a detour. He had missed his way. So we said he should go back. Bike took us to Unity Hall and immediately memories started dropping. So I immediately sent home that they should look for some old albums and bring me some pictures or whatever. But our interest is to see the growth of members and the church, seeing members growing spiritually and physically, God blessing them, must be our focus. And therefore, we want to be intentional and deliberate to make sure that 
we reposition ourselves. That's why we are saying for maximum impact. It means we are doing well. But moving on, we really want to have a more impactful ministry in the nations. So the second one, which has to do with Colossians 2, 6 and 7, it says, So then, just as you have you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing. It means that when we come to accept Christ, the message that was given to us, we should continue in that message and live our lives according to how we were taught. Then we'll be able to get our roots well, firmly grounded in the system. And whilst we get rooted, we'll be built up, be strong, to be able to face the challenges and then be able to have the meaning and the impact that is required of us. Dearly beloved in the Lord, I know, I remember 2013 when I was elected as a general secretary. The Pentecost Fire team then interviewed me. There's something I, they, they, they asked me how I was going to manage the youth. And I told them, for me, the youth have strength, they have energy, they have speed. So I was going to use the wisdom and the knowledge of the old to partner with their strength and their speed and the exuberance of the youth to move the church forward. Because I learned a lot from Paul and Timothy, the way Paul handled Timothy. You remember, or when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, Paul refers to Timothy as my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. It sends a message of some affection, some bonding between Paul and Timothy at the time. So you realize that Paul saw Timothy's potential as a great spiritual leader in the future and subsequently invested in this young man so that when the leadership mantle is handed over to him, he will not be found wanting. So as Paul planted churches around the Mediterranean and converted thousands to Christianity, he realized he needed a trustworthy person, note it, a trustworthy person to carry on after he died. He chose this young man and then discipled him. So Paul chose Timothy and intentionally discipled him because he found in him some leadership potential. So I'm talking about patching the youth for maximum impact. As the youth director rightly said, we have over, about 80% of our members uh, being less than 40. I, I, I was doing this, and whenever I, I, I visit an assembly, I ask them to stand, and virtually the room becomes empty. And I observe that uh, we have the youth being in the, in the majority. And therefore, whenever we are doing planning and everything, our focus should be on the youth. That's why we have space for you. This year, the, last August, the youth ministry alone brought us about eight memos, and we took all. And the youth director had to come and defend it. So, in our planning and schemes, we factor the youth because we see potential in you. If God picks some of us, one entities, as it were, and has brought us thus far in ministry, and then in the nation, we're able to contribute our quota. I see that if you avail yourself and subject yourself to training, the Lord will take you very, very far. So Timothy was a young man who began traveling with Paul and Silas along the coast doing ministry here and there. So Paul intentionally mentored Timothy for the tax ahead. So when Paul picked Timothy as a successor, he realized this young man would work among the Jews. So Paul circumcised Timothy. Acts chapter 16 verse 3. Timothy subjected himself to circumcision because he wanted to have impact in the future. The leader saw something in him. He knew that the work would grow and therefore you need this young man to partner him in ministry. But going to work among the people who, the Jews, who, who 
who, 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 who liked or accepted people who were circumcised. Paul decided to circumcise Timothy. That was painful. And I want to throw the challenge for you. If you want to be a leader in this church, if you want God to take you very far, you should be able to go through some circumcision. You should be able to subject yourself to pruning, some cutters, some molding. If you are doing construction, you don't always put full blocks. Sometimes you need some a space, about some four inch to fill. You are the blocks are 18 inches, so you have to cut. So the block that will allow itself to be chopped or cut is the block that will be able to fix there. Dearly beloved in the Lord, if you want the Lord to take you very far, as you work with leaders, allow yourself to be circumcised. Turn to your brother or sister and tell the person, if you want to have the meaningful impact in the society and in the church, allow yourself to be circumcised. Mm, it's very, very, and it's very, very painful. Hello? It's, what I mean by circumcision, anything that is unwanted in your life, and then anything that will make you accepted as a true ambassador of Christ. Because Timothy was going to minister the gospel to the Jews. But there was something they didn't like. And therefore, Paul insisted or advised the young man to allow himself to be circumcised. Which Timothy humbly obliged and allowed himself to be circumcised. So Paul did that, read Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 and Galatians 6 15. Paul did that so that Timothy will be accepted. Because of that training, Timothy was able to position himself to make himself all things for all people so that the people he would be working among that the Jews who accept him because he had subjected himself to pruning and uh, circumcision. What's wrong in, mentoring? in the mentoring process was to exercise patience. So leaders ought to exercise patience when we work or work with the youth. As young Timothy grew in wisdom and faith, he spent much time teaching him and even addressed two books of the New Testament to Timothy, who was then pastoring the church at Ephesus. If you read 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul took time to train. Sometimes in, in our mentoring system, we, we don't uh, exercise some restraint. And dearly beloved in the Lord, if you want to raise the next generation, you have to go down. I said, they have the zeal. They have the youthful exuberance. They have the energy. I was pastoring, pastoring in Awoshi. I was posted there in 2000 and, and 2001. And one evening, I observed some young men they were very nice, but that time these were tough start things and they don't come and sing all right. But they were too rough and said, hey, hey. So all I had to do is one day I said, one, two, three, follow me. Today you are my sons. So I put them in my vehicle and took them home. They became part of my family. I realized they there were some rough edges. So I went to Methodist Bookshop book shop in Accra Circle, Accra Central to go and buy courtesy for boys and girls. I was going to mentor them, yes. That's for boys and girls. They were grown-ups. They had written their verses. They liked the Lord. They are the people who are used to start, start the, the English assembly at Tawosh, which has now become a PR of I remember when I was inaugurating that assembly, I told them that you said you speak English. But because you want to mentor you, I bring your fathers who speak a can to come and preach. Nobody should mock them. Because I want you to be trained. And to cut a long story short, but the word of God and the courtesy for boys and girls, we pruned them. But sooner or later, this guy became very well accepted in the church. One is now in the U.S. He's married and he's holding Ph.D. Another one is a minister in the church. He's now being transferred into the second station. The third one is headmaster in one of the schools in East Village. I've been using them to preach and they themselves are proud about it. And they wouldn't mind if I mention their names. Mentoring, exercising, patient. If you are not careful, throw the baby in the bath water away. They have the energy, they have the fire. They want 
to move as somebody ought to exercise restraint and then pull them along. So dearly beloved in the Lord, even us today, the, the old men, our fathers are prepared to mentor us, to circumcise us, to go and buy courtesy for boys and girls. Don't think you, you can speak big English. Therefore, you don't need training. I remember one time I was reading the newspaper and watching television and then Gideon, I've mentioned that he has a PhD. He crossed. And then Ernest, who is now a pastor, said, Gideon Bravechi. Then we ask, if you are watching television and if your father is watching the television and want to pass, what will courtesy for boys and girls say? Then one will, one will say, go to page thus. You go there and say, Daddy, please, I want to cross. They had finished Wasi, but they needed pruning. They needed circumcision. They needed to be trained so that they would be accepted in the system. Dearly beloved, Paul had to take time to mentor Timothy. That's what made Timothy a good leader. So Paul exhorted Timothy often to guard the truth that he had been entrusted with and take care not to lose his passion in ministry. This young man is good. So you have to shape him, get him refocused and mentor him hold his hands and let him follow your steps. Let him know that there is something good in him. There is a virtue in him you want to nurture so that in the near future when he becomes an adult and is left alone, he will be able to stand his ground. So whilst he was mentoring him, then discipline was also following. So we learn from Paul and Timothy the importance of older men discipling young men. Young Timothy became a pillar in the early church due to Paul's investment in his life when he was a youth. If you listen to the, the advert I did, I threw a challenge to, to our fathers and mothers that this year the youth, we know they want to attend the pencil conference, but they don't have money. When I came to the church, I didn't have money. An eight born out of ten siblings, a peasant farmer's children, but we had fathers who paid for my pastor conferences since I joined the church until I married. They paid. The later the S.Y. Miracles and the Asari and the Elder Kisses, they will pay. So this year, I've paid for a lot. Because that's how they did for us. So we know that we have to help them to be able to, we have to invest in the life when they are youth. We see a potential in them and we know sooner or later we'll leave their scene and they'll be there. So if you don't take pains to invest in them and we are not there, how will the church be? And because we want them to build on a sure, solid foundation so that the church will grow from glory to glory, we ought to invest. That's why anything concerning the youth, the executive council take it very seriously. So Paul did not shelter his young disciple from the realities of ministry. Knowing that learning to suffer well was part of Timothy's presentation. So if we read 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, and then 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, Paul opened up for Timothy to know how life is, the challenges he is going through, and all the difficulties that associated with that were associated with ministry. So for his part, Timothy received the instructions. And did not shy away from the unpleasant part of true discipleship. So, if you want to disciple somebody, you know there will be an unpleasant part. You want to go your way. But your father said, this way will not help. Because you are a Christian. You want to put on a particular attire. Your father said, this attire will not help you. Timothy was prepared to, to, to listen to those advices. Because of their strong relationship, they both benefited and the gospel was widely spread. So the knowledge and the wisdom Paul had acquired, coupled with the strength and the speed and the youthful exuberance in Timothy, the two were able to move the frontiers of the church in their time very, very far. So in the story of Paul and Timothy, we learn that discipleship is standing shoulder to shoulder in the work of the kingdom, regardless of the person's age. Once there is something good in the person, you don't look down on the person because iron sharpens iron. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 17. Encouraging, rebuking when necessary, and sharing a common burden 
for a lost world. So you ought to encourage them, rebuke, and then share the burden that is on your heart. But we recall that the key character observation Paul made before bringing Timothy closer was trustworthiness. Somebody say trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. Then ask yourself, can we trust you? Do you trust yourself? Does your parent trust you? I trust you. So God will also trust you. And your parents ought to trust you. So Timothy proved to be so trustworthy that Paul sent him as a representative of the church he was concerned about. The old man could send Timothy without any reservation. He would go and come with good results. First Timothy, First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 2 and then Philippians chapter 2 and verse 19 tells us that. So Timothy became Paul's stand-in and also brought Paul news of the churches when Paul was in prison. So the old man was hot. He has been in prison. But there was this trustworthy guy who was working for him and bringing reports. And he also giving him advice. So Paul included Timothy as an equal partner in addresses to some churches. His salutations in several epistles began with wording such as Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus. So read Philippians chapter 1, Colossians, let me read a few of them for you. So Paul has worked with Timothy to the extent that, that now, because the trust was high, he wasn't shy to address his letters to them. Maybe sometimes I'm trying, I'm not a theologian, but sometimes I think Paul dictated some of the letters for him to write. Or sometimes the young man would draft for the old man to proofread. Because when he addresses it, let's take a few of them. We read 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So the big man is writing the letter with the brother to the church of God at Corinth. Then Philippians 1, 1. Paul and Timothy. Now, he has come down. He has joined the apostle. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ. So rather, the guy is maturing. So even though he doesn't have the title, the old man is not afraid to stand shoulder to shoulder and introduce him to the church as servants. Trustworthiness. Dearly beloved, if you want to have a maximum impact, you must be trusted. You must be trusted. I remember when I was working as a, a resident engineer for this work. What made us get the Kumasi Sports Stadium one was, excuse my language, my trustworthiness and transparency at Accra Sports Stadium. I was there working one day and the, then the late president, who was the vice president, Jay uh, uh, Yatamos, may his soul rest in peace, they came to the site with uh, Honorable E.T. Mensah. And during break, he said, the way you are working, we are thinking of adding Kumasi's one to your boss. Will you be the same person that will survive it? That's how can one person have to survive two projects. I spent three days in Kumasi and then three days in Accra. Even when I came to Ministry 99, for my first six months, the company was paying me because I had to complete. From November 99 to this, uh, June, 20, June 2000, I was running these two projects because of that guy. The second job didn't go for tender. And people didn't understand it. So after the can 2000, if you read the newspapers out there, have them in my box, you can come and read. There was a probe, the term Abon Waha probe. I appeared about 12 times to the committee. It was, it was live on TV3 and all that. They didn't find me having stolen a pin. The reports are there. And my boss sometimes will just watch the television and laugh because this man you are grilling, you can't find anything. Can you be trusted to the extent that your bosses and the big men will say this about you in your absence? If you want to have the maximum impact, there must be trustworthiness. Somebody say trustworthiness. So I have a couple of them there. If you read the apostles, Paul will say Paul and Timothy, Paul and Timothy, all because he has mentored a guy, he has discipled him, and the guy was a trustworthy person. Somebody who will not undermine his boss. 
Somebody who will not pull his boss down. Somebody who would not pretend as if he knows more than his boss. Yes, you are young. You can speak good English. You are young. You are eloquent. But remember, the church is built on the foundations of apostles and prophets. Once they are there, if you sit on their lap, you go very far. But if you stand on their neck, they will leave you and you fall flat. May the good Lord himself have mercy on us. So let's look at some lessons from our forebears. What they did that has made this church the way it is. So that even as we want to have a maximum impact, the baton is being given to you. But you ought to know how far they have come. You see, with our concept of repositioning, as I said, we are not saying anything that something has gone amiss. We just want to be careful. And permit me to say, even yesterday I said this somewhere, that our, our, our intent and what is at the back of our mind, we all know that when in, there is a flood, the river carries along with a lot of things. Now the church has grown. We have the numbers. So we want to be careful to sit back and look at the flow and pick whatever is not wanted from the flow. That's what we are doing. So we are moving all right, but we want to make sure that we have a free flow. And to be able to have a free flow, any log that is accompanying the stream, we want to pick out in any debris. So let's look at how our forebears worked. So that if there is something that we have to do away with, or a new thing you ought to catch, then you can pick it and run with. So we want to pick some lessons from our forebears. Every country, community, group, or, or some other entity has something which defines them. This may be reflected in their worldview, which shapes their ethics. Simply put the right thing to do and ethos, how things ought to be done. It is ultimately summed up in their culture. So every institution has their do's and don'ts and they sum up in the way they do their things or they go about their work. They embrace it often without questioning. Ethos and ethics which over the years become a culture. You embrace it without questioning. I don't know whether you've ever asked yourself why when you put on suit, you should wear a tie. I don't know whether you've asked yourself or you've asked that question. And I, I don't know whether your son has asked you or you yourself as an adult have ever asked, why do you have to pound fufu? If you want to eat fufu, why don't you chew the, 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 the cassava and then you pound it? It becomes a culture. So cultures are not questionable. It is tried and tested and it has worked. So you build on it. You build on it. So you embrace it often without questioning. They, they cherish it as the way to do it until something dramatic happens to shift that paradigm. They will cling tenaciously to it until we will agree that we observe these things are not too good for us. So we want to tackle it. Otherwise, you can't sit here somewhere and change it. If we want to change a culture, we all have to agree and say, this is how we want to go about things. So the church, being a divine origin but composed of humans, is captured by biblical ethics and ethos. Aspects of these are often shaped by the culture of the receiving community. So as we move, uh, Pastor Jim McKeon came. He came with the gospel. But he didn't ask us to throw away our culture. He situated the gospel into our culture. And we moved with it. Soon, the church becomes identified by its culture. Its adherents cherish this culture so dearly that they will resist any attempt to change it. I remember when we came to the church, my wife and her friends, they used to tease us or tell us, yeah, mama said, yeah, papa, no, man, sorry. They were jealous. Hello. This is off. They were jealously guarding what their parents had taught them. So items of the culture are no-go areas. They are considered sacrosanct. Once it's a culture, they are considered sacrosanct. Unless you are inquisitive, not just maybe want to change, that you ask your mom, why do you do this? Why do you do this? When it's a way of life. Why do you have to sweep? We don't ask, why do we have to do these things? Like every other church, 
The church of Pentecost have our own culture. Our fundamental beliefs are the heart of our theology. We have our governance system and our way of expressing practical Christian life and ministry. Our ministry, if you want to be a COP minister, we are not celibates. You have to marry. And we, four, five years, six, we go on transfer. That's how we do our thing. And then after school, no matter your degree, you come to COP as a professor. I've been telling the students, you have to drop all the titles and let grace carry you. You drop the titles. So if you're a professor and then you pass the ministry interview, then the letter goes. We drop even everything. And then we will give you a name, probationary basia. That is our culture. That's our culture. Hello? It's just recently that we are trying to accommodate. When we came, I had to drop my engineer. I never wrote letters with ING. But recently, because I'm dealing with some government and some things, I'm, I'm trying to use it because, because of some acceptance. But in the church, we are engineer and it's professional overseer. That is the culture. So that we know that here it is grace. It's not titles. Otherwise, the young man who is selling at Cantamanto, who has also passed the ministry interview and come to the class, his level is wasi. And he's seated in the same, he's seated in the same class with a professor. We will not look at the professor. We will look at the ministry and the grace. That is our culture. So, so these things we don't question. If you question, you sit in the class. After the nine months training, I'll be posted here. We'll be doing your calculations. Before I realize, the professor is somewhere, and the no title is somewhere. When the report came, where we want to minister and interact them in the class, the Holy Spirit told us whose grace is higher. He didn't tell us the titles. God have mercy. So cultures are considered as no-go areas and they are sacrosanct. So as a church, we love and cherish these practices so dearly. Everyone who comes into our fold must know and identify and uh, diligently apply themselves to them. So once you have become a COP member, we love our culture. Allow yourself to be circumcised of any unwanted material that will dilute our culture. Allow yourself to be properly mentored and discipled because we trust you. One day, one day you'll be somewhere. One day, one day you'll be somewhere. So we COP members know that God made a covenant with our forebears. And the covenant shaped the tenets, which also engendered our core values and church culture including the rules of conduct so observe that we are told some years 37 40 something on three different occasions different three different locations three different occasions three different locations three different people giving the same prophecy so it became a covenant and then out of the covenant our forebears sat down how do we make this work then it births our tenets so as they work with the tenant, they got something they call core values. And they practice the core values over time and it has become church culture. And now we have do's and don'ts. And these things, until my own visitors again and challenge us to stop them, some of them will never stop. Because it has become culture. And it is a Bible base. Observing these tenets, core values, church culture, and rules of conduct have given the COP a unique and enviable brand. You see? Because these things have made us unique and enviable, which ought to be, these things ought to be gathered jealously from where I sit. The churches come to, that come to us with their leaders to come and learn how we run our church. And we say it is no good. Not like, it's very enviable and therefore we want to guide them jealous so we encourage all youth of our church to brand themselves accordingly say to your sister or brother sister brand yourself accordingly 
if you really want to have the maximum impact you're talking about brand yourself accordingly because cop is a brand somebody says cop is a brand so because i don't have time let's move to the cop branding contest because brands go beyond identification they represent what the corporate body or individual stands for our vision mission goals and mandates they define our brand or a brand so the cop brand 3.2 I've, I've skipped that let's go to 3.2 because of time in the old testament god identified the israelites as a unique brand in the new testament jesus christ branded the church with the power of the holy spirit miracles signs and wonders Reading the Acts of the Apostles, the church developed a brand of being spirit-filled, communal living, and mission-minded. It was out of this that early believers in Antioch were called Christians. After the death and resurrection of Christ, the people who followed Christ, the way they led their lives, it became a brand. And these people, these people, these people are Christians. And can we go on? hello so that name christian therefore became a brand name for believers and followers of christ in view of this one would expect that the concept of branding will be a major tool for modern day churches this is according to one peter white for the church of pentecost our brand therefore can be said to be what to be that which identifies and distinguishes us from other churches you just sit down carefully our church is a brand look at the things that identify us and distinguishes us from others you can list it yourself and becomes a brand let me just throw one in one just dropped it is in cop that because we have been taught that when we are going to church you are not just going to receive when they have time for the rules of conduct we are not just going to receive so you prepare yourself because when you meet each has a song a hymn a revelation and a word so you go with something that's why a whole chairman an apostle will be preaching and an old lady will raise a song and the apostle will stop and join the old lady go to other churches where that you see these things happen when the papa is speaking the papa is speaking it is a brand so the person seated there is attentive that's why mama unisadison was able to get a lot a lot of songs our fathers will be ministering and the woman will sit somewhere there and raise a song it has dropped the word misses on their heart and then the piano on their heart produces some songs it is a brand and this one we will never stop if you build on it you have a maximum impact if you cut this short you kill the initiative in the members so when he's coming to church he knows everything is going to be read that's why when we come to church we, all, we give space somebody will come and sing another will come and read the bible but no so we do all these things it is a brand so you list that i've just stated one list sit down weigh some churches and then see the things that are unique with us which distinguishes us from them and you see that we have a brand which we have to jealously guard so there are things which shape people's perception about the church and what we do i must say that though the church began with people who were not so much educated Yet, the Holy Spirit inspired them to create a brand which has made the church unique, distinguished, and respected in the world. So if our forebears, who were not educated, God used them to build this church, then we who are educated, if we add their wisdom, the church will go very, very far. Very, very, very far. Not neglecting or putting aside what they did, building on this. If these people who didn't attend school but rely on the Holy Spirit giving us this brand I want to beg of you don't throw that away just add your education and then run with it 
and the church will go very, very far. Since 1st August 1962, when the name of the church, church of Pentecost was changed from Ghana Apostolic Church to the Church of Pentecost, the brand name has really worked for the church in how Ghanaians accepted it to be a church with a name linked to the event that happened on the day of Pentecost. Currently, in Ghana, the Church of Pentecost is found in every community. You go anywhere, you identify yourself as a Church of Pentecost member, you are accepted. Anywhere, not that we who are leaders. When we are even members, you wear a witness badge. And you, went, you enter a banking hall, you are accepted because it is a brand. Recently, a lady was accosted in a shaman somewhere. She has put on the women's scarf and women's dress and she was doing her own thing. Look at how the Pentecost people pounce on them. They are accosted her. No, you can't own yourself, mommy. They were jealously guarding the COP brand. So they wouldn't let any person to, 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 to do something that will uh, water down the brand or lower the standard. One of the weaknesses of many Pentecostal churches in West Africa and for that matter in Ghana is the lack of properly laid down administrative structures and plans for the management of their churches. Dearly beloved, your church, our church, has solid try and tested administrative structures. It's not taught anywhere, but it works. I'll, I'll come to that. It's not taught anywhere, but it works. I remember when I became GS some 10 years ago, some advised me I should take courses at Jimpa and all that. I could have done that. Not that I was proud enough. But I realized the workload there didn't give me space. But due to the structure that is in place, you just work in it and the church moves. These things we are doing is not taught in any university. It's not in any book. It is a brand. Not too long ago, there was a value for, value for Money conference and I was invited to come and give a presentation. I think Apostle Dr. Boete is here. Dr. Joe, yeah, we present, we put our thoughts together. He joined me. And when we went to do the presentation, the Vice President said, wow. Honorable Salvador said, say, wow. They, they couldn't imagine how we're running our churches. It's not in any university. It is a brand which wants you to jealously God. And once you do that, it will take us very, very far. Dearly beloved, I joined the church not too long ago, just about 40, some 44 years ago. Not too long. Just some 44 years ago. I'm not Greek crowd. So just some 44 years ago. And I believe I've seen few things that have fed into the branding of the church. From my point of view, few things I want to share with you. I may not be able to talk about everything, but I've listed a few which I think are significant. And they are enshrined or you can find them in our core values and the church culture. One, consistent Bible reading. It's our culture. If you want to go very, very far and have meaningful impacts, you have to be consistent in your Bible reading and teaching. Your personal devotion and how you spend time to study the word of God. In our church, preaching and teaching the Bible is done in regular basis. Churches, church services, conventions, evangelistic crusades and rallies, everything is based on the word. Settlement of disputes is always preceded by the word. The presbytery says some people have carried a husband and wife, they have challenges. They come to the presiding at the moment of Mumpai. After your mom pay now, young can come Bible. Young can, young can some. We don't do anything without the Bible. And we had an old man at whom open your cry. The Bible had suffered in a sense. You go to his village or room somewhere. Every page in Takrasha, they were they were eating the word proper. We meet an old man's Bible, and the Bible has suffered. Yours is on your iPad. It's good. But how often and how consistent are you with the reading of the Bible? That is a brand. Every COP member dwells or does everything based on the, on, on the teaching and, and the word of God. It is not uncommon to hear statements like, brothers and sisters, we cannot proceed without hearing the word. I've heard it before. 
I have come meeting now. Or your bomb pie na I wanted to proceed and do some I'm saying, planning committee. Some then somebody raised his hand, make up our soon. And we are no bomb so bomb pie we and Kenya may have some year meeting. And immediately you have to reorganize yourself. <laughs> because it is a brand. If you want to go very far, don't throw this away. And then they will say that my Bible tells me. Recall uh, Rev. Apostle Jude Hammer. When every year, those days when it was the scripture you don't see you, every year when it comes to the, the council meeting, he wouldn't conclude his uh, fraternal greeting without Pentecost Friday or say, Bible say. If you want to marry, Bible say. If you want to go to school, Bible say. Everything a COP member wants to do, Bible say. Oh, yes. Yes. And this is a brand. I remember 92 when I was going to marry. That was when church, just 92. When I was going to marry, the elder who was mentoring me at the SY Miracle, he had given me a room and I was going to marry. Then he said he didn't understand why I should leave her house. Well, she was going to give me a place for me, myself, and my wife. My wife, too, was also staying with a rich man, his father, Elder Kisi. He had about four different houses in town. But I told them, the Bible says, That is what broke them. That's what broke them. My in law has about four or three different houses, compound houses people had rented. Elder Miracle had. Peace House and Peace Villa. Camper houses. I left there to go and rent a hall and chamber for my wife who was a rich man's daughter to visit a public toilet because Bible say. This is a brand. For this a man shall leave. So I'm a man and I should leave and go and clinch. And we left and we clinched. And since 92, yeah, what a come on. God's Bible said, Let's give a clap of prayer to the Lord. So, if you want to do anything and you, that you want to have impact, if you really want to have impact in life, your foundation is Bible. So in COP, Bible say, the Bible on Kaya, my friend, you are a Nairia Sinyansa and Koye. Then the next one I want to talk about is evangelism. In the church, evangelism is a way of life. It's not a ministry. It's not a preserve of a few. Every individual in the church is an evangelist. When you come, you are thought to go and bring. Hello. I was asked to make it practical. We are 10 in our family. I'm the eight born. When I got converted, my, my father was still a drunkard. And I was sleeping somewhere with him in somebody's kiosk. Till later. Opposite to whom GNTC. Somebody's tailoring shop. That's why I was sleeping with my father. When I, then, when I converted to the church, not too, not too long, Adam Miracle identified me and took me to his house. These are some of the stories it's a, for another day. So I had to work on my father. And thank God the drunkard died a Christian. And during his funeral in 2003 at Suhum, the people were wow. Because this was a man who used to drink and fall asleep on the streets. And now apostles were going to bury him. It's because of the power of the gospel. So for us, dawn broadcasts, open air services, evangelistic campaigns, rallies, crusade, every opportunity. Those days we used to, you can say, you crab Bible, you crack a chat. You write to institutions outside and they bring your charts. So when the students come home, Sami Doku is here. Tate Doku, Lieutenant Kumiwood, Lieutenant Kendu Kumiwood, and then Tuyapia, and then ABM. Every vacation after village evangelism, this year they will come to Sumu, do evangelism, 
You go to Zoom, they know this, my friends. There's an old man who is about 90 years. He can recollect the songs at the, at the cave and thoughts at Zoom. We come with pitch camp and saturate the system with the word of God. Then the next season, we go to hope. Bible, after, after, after developing our spiritual life, then you have to move into the communities. So evangelism, you're the triumphant man. It's part of us. If you want to have an impact, be an evangelist. You enter any community, let them know you have arrived. That one alone protects you from evil. I remember once I was preaching somewhere and I threw a challenge to them because I shared the gospel all over the place. And I said, Maba Mugu, I want to be catching some ass in the pepper. Mofa Mumbe, Radina Mabra, and Sister Amosi, there. And they were coming. I threw a challenge because at the marketplace, at the hospital, at the church, trust, everywhere the word has been shared. So after studying the Bible, the next thing that you have to do is to move on to evangelism. Every member, every you have the strength. Now you have the social media space. Use it. Then that's why this church planting. I'll skip it. And let me come to discipleship. I've also spoken about it under. Uh, the, 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 the uh, mentorship. So I'll go to personal practical holiness. In our church, holiness is something that everyone ought to work on. Item 4.5. Whereas it is true that nobody can or should judge another person's status in holiness, the church believes that sanctification is also progressive. The believer responds to the work of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by bearing fruit of the Spirit. So in the church, holiness becomes a personal pursuit. Everybody wants to work on, it, on his or herself so that some weaknesses in their life will be dealt with. Members should therefore not drink alcohol, these things. The teachers, it was taught in church. It was spelled out. I remember once, I assumed there was this gentleman who had come to uh, accept Christ and not too long ago, he was coming to give a testimony. And then when he stood, he started to cast on the paper before the bottom, a lot of paper. Immediately after that, there was a press between me. We had to work on the person. How is your level of holiness? Because we are taught that without holiness, no man can see God. This was... Also, when I was a young man at Bomoso, and also Apostle Elsa Asante was my brother, my friend, me, and Michael, so I'm a The way they raised the standard of prayer and holiness at Bomoso, you dare not. Tell your point, so I'm a coffee street. Bokofi street. Even when they are playing drafts, you want to go near, you think you will sin, you fall, you, 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 you commit some sin. Whatever people meet and they are not Christians, you can't even join them. And because of this standard, we those days, men can demonstrate, were taught to the extent that even if you wear jeans, it wasn't those who wear jeans were they were classified as to be cobolos. Excuse me. Codro, codro, uh -huh. it's in region, codro. So you even know where you went to street your tuna when you are going or somewhere. Because the standard of holiness was so high that you were careful not to be missed or be suspected or to be perceived as being one of them. So you were sanctimonious. The thing was inside, not hypocritical, because the holiness life was a personal pursuit. And we were each other's keeper. So we were helping ourselves to grow. And then that leads to communion. Communion service. The brand in the COP, one of the, the, the issues we cherish, the communion service. It is a day that we so much put premium on, not only on the time, because we know if you don't eat, you can move on. And it was a time to test your holiness level, how you have led your life for the previous month. Because those who not attend communion will be called and interviewed and asked questions. And not that you are going to cover up. You want to be faithful and sincere. So you confess and deal with your any hidden sin. So you come boldly to the table to take it. If you don't come, we'll meet you. Not for sanction, but at least questions will be asked. Hello? 
These days, if you are not careful, you think it, it is my private life. And therefore, you can't go there. Then prayer. Prayer to us key. This afternoon, when myself and us were assigned to when we were passing by Pajo, we said, Empire, yet do a park, I hope you will still be in Kaboin on Pajo. Or they don't let you go there. There's a basement here, and then the Pajo. Oh, Kumi, uh, Samir Doku, my roommate. He was my roommate, Fana here. After studying, and we are tired, then we go on a prayer walk. We come to there, you meet Kumi Wood, you meet Keba, it's another church service. <laughs> And these guys, where two or three, this guy meets God is there. They'll just give it another one hour. That's how my prayer will cry. And nobody, and so you have one left. Those days in Mormon, so after we have closed from church, this man organized the youth again. Now we close from church, and the church room is dead. No. With these huge auditoriums, youths! Wow! Don't waste your energy. Those men are tired. They go to church six to eight. They have clothes. And what are you going to do at home? Just to WhatsApp and be on Facebook? No. If you want to have an impact, you go eat, change yourself, and come the whole night. You have the energy. If you go, because if you stay in your bed, you'll be just watching YouTube and Facebook. And that will not edify you. So you go back and go and pray. Because we are told that prayer is the work. And the work is prayer. So in COP, prayer was for everything. Even to the extent that during our time, when we are going to get married, you, the, the church, the youth, organize all night for you. I enjoy that. Yes. Sami Doki is here. A day before the wedding, the assembly, the youth, the witness movement will organize all night for you because they want to pray you into the marriage. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, so, you see, we don't... These songs like... Uh, Those songs are all and when we start this, and Sami Doku is doing this, now Sami Doku is here. Then justice, justice, go for you. Pray, 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 pray. Justice, Joama. I bought you me a baby. With prayer, we'll bring it now. With prayer, we'll bring it down. Come on, raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. Oh, come on, Oh, come on, Oh, come on, Satan. Oh, come on, Oh, come on, Oh, come on, Oh, come on, Oh, come on,
Let's resume our seats. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet spirit, I pray. Come, in the strength and thy power. Come, in your own special way. He's coming, he's coming. Come, Holy Spirit, we need you. Ah, the cabal. Come, sweet spirit, we pray. Come, in your strength and thy power. Come, in your Because they like praying and cherish prayer. Thank you very much. It led to the Pentecostal experience. When we came to the church, our brand is that anybody who has served Christ must speak in tongues. Anybody, everybody ought to speak in tongues. So ours is not the, the Holy Spirit baptism that is in you. Ours is the one that is firstly comes out with the evidence of talking. When we came, the interpreters on scriptures, when theologians came in, we realized it was wrongly interpreted, but it worked. Let me say it. So for us, Sankawa won't come. So yet they never come. Because of Papa Nebunes. This is our brand. So any member who is a COP member ought to a must and should speak in tongues. Otherwise, you've not arrived. And because of this challenge, the youth ministry at the time, that the Pensa guys and the evangelism that I'm witnessed women were always alert. I recall there was a crusade that soon. So I was And we assigned to ourselves the young men. Every night, the convert that came had to be baptized. We for that So after the rally or the crusade, each night, if there were nine, we assigned it to ourselves. Mobe kasa, uji di no kasa ya na usi de mobe kane. Abekan. So by the end of the crusade, there was no backlog. Water baptism had been done. And the Holy Spirit baptism have been done. So Sunday we go to church, there is celebration. This is our brand. So dearly beloved, if you want to really have the impact that you desire, don't leave the Holy Spirit. And don't deceive yourself. Let anybody tell you it is inside. If you believe, you must speak. I tell people that so if the thing is there I want to hear let it come out and that is our trademark and once the thing is charged in the person he is able to work according to how the spirit leads the person so in those days because of that reliance on the Holy Spirit there was no special deliverance service Every service, the Holy Spirit will take over. So what they measured on was the Holy Spirit baptism. When the Spirit comes, everything is done. I've told you, if you know my story, we came from fetish background. So when I became converted, I had some talisman around my wrist. There were some pebbles in my pocket. 79. After that scripture, you know, on night that I got converted. I myself went to throw it into the public toilet. Nobody delivered me. 
Because not too soon I spoke in tongues. And if I'm speaking in tongues and Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with Holy Ghost and power, doing good, healing the sick. If this man is in me, who dare deliver me? Because the message that saved me was John 8 that says, If the Son shall set you free, ye must be free indeed. So after receiving this powerful message, I don't need deliverance. It's a challenge. You may have your own interpretation. But that's the COP. So when we go to the Kokoa Simpaba on Friday, and we pray, Oje, Oja, Susu, Koko, Ben, Oja. Once you pray, the Holy Spirit comes, then the deliverance follows. We didn't have deliverance pastors. We have men of God filled with the Holy Spirit. What we need at the Koko Asim Parable is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Once the Holy Spirit comes, the deliverance will follow. So the person is not baptized with the Holy Spirit, you deliver the person. The Bible says you go and bring another servant stronger. So for us, the Holy Spirit should come first. And once he comes, he will do the deliverance. 44 years, 40, 44 years or so. 42 years or 44, I'm a sacrifice. No deliverance. But my catch us. When I was coming, I was coming as an outdoor worshiper. Somebody who's, uh, on whom blood has been sprinkled on a dust, uh, on, on a disposal point or whatever, that the, the, the blood should dry before I go to bed. I'm We've been there and here, and we know, and we are telling you the truth. Let the Holy Spirit come. Once he comes and you speak in tongues, you have your deliverance. That is sealed. That's why we are worried when people are rolling people and sprinkling because we know these are schemes. They want you to become slaves to them. I challenge you, just stand and be filled with the Holy Spirit and see whether any evil spirit can enter. So the church is perceived by many as the Holy Ghost Church. We all recall this video that went by where East Sudanaba was saying that in the COP, everything is Holy Ghost. To marry, Holy Ghost. To drink, Holy Ghost. To buy vehicle, Holy Ghost. This is our brand. And we dare not throw that away. <laughs> Let me touch on a few and then drop the mic. Leadership development. This I want. In our church, we have a philosophy. We grow our own timber and use it. So when the new convert comes, we endeavor to work on the person. Listen, leadership development is from the grassroots level. With members maturing into becoming small group and ministry leaders. And then on to ordained lay officers as of, uh, deacons, deaconesses and elders. So we don't jump. We develop you. If you are a leader, let us see it at the local level. So some of us, we are just jumping from church to church and doing church shopping. Identify yourself at a local. Let them give you some work to do. And once you have some work to do and they see the grace on you, the grace carry you further. So there's nothing like lateral injection. No, it's a free flow. So identify an assembly and then get involved because we want to develop you from there before you become a leader. One significant factor which has contributed to the COP brand is the way we call people into ministry and leadership. I've spoken well about that. And then the kind of succession plan that we have in the church. Ministry, to come into full-time ministry, begins at the local. Begins at where you fellowship. And then the next one is, in COP, we believe in the second coming of Christ. So in our church, our fathers were so much and gross in it that Every meeting when they are about to close, they will say, if Christ tarries. God will thought that as we are going, he may come. Therefore, be careful the way you walk. And then if Jesus does not come tonight, then we shall meet. Some of these small, small things side us to remain focused. Then there was constant reminder to us personal holiness. There's a constant reminder to preach the gospel. There's a constant reminder towards doing good works. Then church discipline. Somebody say church discipline. It is a church with discipline irrespective of your stature or stature or whatever. Once you don't conduct yourself well, we discipline. But we don't discipline to destroy. We discipline to reform. So when something happens and the leadership calls you 
it's for information. It's in extreme cases that we excommunicate. Recently, we, 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 been, we are mindful of using excommunication. We do severance of relationship. If you're in the church, you decide to establish your church. It's not, we just say, just take your church and let's be. But I want to emphasize that in our church, we believe in discipline. Let me spend some five minutes to run up and touch on church culture. First one, respect for authority. Dearly beloved, respect for people's stature, age. Because of the offices and the titles we've given them, let's respect leadership, the hierarchy. The deacon, the deaconesses, the elder, pastor, apostle, prophet helps us to respect the authority. You see, it's because of the authority that when Apostle Ntumi became the chairman, it wasn't his age. A number of years he has spent in ministry, but the title is chairman. So once he becomes chairman at age 40, Apostle Anson, who had been his area head before, had to respect him. This is our culture. When somebody is ordained or moved into another office, because of the title, you are called the person the fullest respect. This is our brand. Otherwise, it will be like me by matching. I came before him. No. For us, as I said, it is grace. When the grace locate the person and the favor of God is on the person and is moved into an office, you forget about your relationship and then. Sami Doku is my roommate. Sorry, I mean, today I said this has impact. So I should say, Sami Doku was my roommate. He helped me to plan my wedding, 92. But when I became genius today, he called me boss. Since 2013, up to now, Sami has never called me Alex again. He calls me boss. He has moved from Alex to the office. Respect of authority. This is our brand. I want to beg of you never to depart from that. Therefore, our rules of conduct item F says, and let me read, during casual conversations at work or home, do not speak disrespectfully or disparagingly about the church and God's servants. Make your concerns and grievances known to the appropriate authorities for explanation or redress. On this call, I humbly want to plead and beg of you. Don't let what happened to Miriam and Aaron before you. Whenever I want to speak ill about this church, be careful. Now you go on social media and People are just washing leaders in the church. I fear. I don't have time, but I'll give you an assignment. Go and read Numbers chapter 12, verse 1 to 15. And then tear John, the Theotrophus. The and then read Numbers chapter 12. Listen, once God has given leadership to people to run the affairs of the church during your casual conversations, any meeting, just that I was speaking, I said, if you meet a young man, let's say my son, if he goes out to discuss me with other people, and people see the guy, they will not respect him. So we are a family. We have leaders in the church. If you don't understand anything, the structure is there. For us, we run open door administration. We take memos. So how come you call yourself a church member and you go on social media and wash the church there. If you have done so, you need conversion. Because if you read Numbers chapter 12, Aaron was older and Miriam, they were all older than Moses. But when leadership fell on the way of Moses and they spoke ill about him, God did not spare them. I will not go there, but if you don't understand anything, ask. It's becoming one too many. I'm a social media guy. I read a lot on the social media every night, and it's worrying. Simple thing, and the way people discuss. Some are even bold to say, I'm a member. 
and mention the assembly. Yes, you remember we are not giving scholarships. So you we are, remember we are not giving scholarships. We are building prisons. So you should insult. Mm. In our church, we don't do that. Tell your neighbor in our church, we don't do that. If you want to have maximum impact, have respect for authority. But if you don't understand anything, engage. As the youth director, the way they've been bringing a lot of engage, let's discuss so that we all leverage on what we know and then move on. And then there is a strong sense of belonging in the church. Feel belonged. Don't feel like you're an outsider. But we say we are no more a aliens or strangers. We are fellow citizens of God's people and members of God's household. So feel part of the church. For a why would you? So fight for the church outside and come in. Let's solve our problems. Don't join those outside to fight the church. Hello. And then we have mutual respect for one another. And then let me touch on moderation in dressing and appearance. Moderation. Be moderate. Our ladies, don't expose sensitive parts of your bodies to church, to, of your bodies to people when you come to church. Sometimes I ask people, some dresses you cannot wear to your office. But for church, you decide to give Jesus free. Hey, Jesus, Jesus on your guys out. Jesus on your guys out. So, 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 let's, let's be decent in our dress. If you want to have maximum impact, you should be accepted. Recently, we traveled somewhere. I think I was from UK to Canada. And then, we got to a place. Some guys came to me. They thought I was a field staff, ground staff there. And they started asking me about the flight. And then I, I said, we are not an officer here. And your dressing looks smart. Another occasion, I was traveling with my boys. We got to uh, Amsterdam. We just walked through. I just put the passport. They didn't access anything because their appearance suggests they are decent people. Decency will take you very far. So please, in COP, we emphasize on moderation in dressing and appearance. The young men are advised to dress honorably. Let me pull. And then the next one, sacrificial service to church. I'll touch on that and conclude. Sacrificial service to church. In this church, we contribute to the kitty. We don't eat from it. Say we contribute to the church. We don't eat from it. So you ask yourself, what are you bringing in? Since I finished school in 1991, I've done a lot of structural designs for the church, but God is my witness. I've not taken a dime. Because we were taught that if God blesses you with something, we contribute to the growth of the church. You work outside and then you support the growth of the church. When you need your expertise and your knowledge, you bring it on board because it is family business. The church is family business. So nobody should eat from the family because that we work from outside to support it. But these days, you are not careful. People go to sweep even church and they want to be paid. Everybody wants to be professional. He does this, he's a professional. He's an event organizer. So when somebody is going to get wedded, the first one to hire her. Otherwise, all says are all they But during our time, People did all these things freely. Dearly beloved in the Lord, the church has a brand. And because of the work our forebears have done, this church has a good name. There's the question I put, I normally put to pastors. I want to throw it here. Ask yourself. The way our forebears built, taught, and built this brand for us. If they leave the church to us today, how will the church look like tomorrow? Arrest my case. May the good Lord himself help us so that even as we prepare you to take over when the battle or the baton is handed over to you, God himself will use you to have the needed impact in the church and in the nations. God bless us all.